Hi everyone and welcome to the chapter 8 lecture for microbiology. This chapter is a long one and it's complex because we get into genetics. Well, not really genetics in terms of like Mendelian genetics and crosses and dominant and recessive. We don't even go there, but we are going to talk about the molecular biology of the genetic material and how we encode genes in the DNA and ultimately turn them into proteins um, in great detail. So just a quick overview of the chapter. First, we're going to talk about the structure of DNA. We'll talk about how it's copied. We call that DNA replication. And then we're going to get into gene expression. So that's how the, we go from DNA to RNA to proteins. Um, we'll talk about genetic regulation, basically how genes are turned on and off. We'll talk about DNA recombination, which is a technique that we have learned to use to our advantage in biotechnology, but is something that bacteria and viruses do naturally. So we'll talk about sort of natural uh, occurrences of DNA recombination and then also how we can manipulate it for <clears throat> our purposes. We'll talk about mutations and how they occur in the different types of mutations. And, and then we'll get a little bit into genetic engineering and these tools that we've developed from everything we have learned about the basics of DNA replication and expression. So some terms to start with. <clears throat> when it comes to genetics, genetics is the study of heredity. So long before we knew there was any kind of physical material that passed things on to people. Heredity actually comes from, comes from the word heir, like an heir to uh, an estate. So for a long time, when people died, they passed on their belongings to their offspring well before we knew that they actually passed actual genetic or biological um, material to their offspring. So the term heredity predates the term genetics. Genetics is relatively new. We didn't know the structure of DNA until the 1950s. We didn't even know the existence of, of genes, of pass-alongable traits, really, until like the 1800s, I think. So a little history for you. Um, so genetics is the field of science that studies heredity, that studies how uh, DNA is transferred from parent to offspring. The genome is the full collection of DNA of an organism. So all of the genes in the organism, all of its DNA. So for a virus, I'll start on the right side here, for a virus, uh, it's all of its nucleic acid material, whether it's RNA or DNA, is found inside the capsid that is the viral genome, and it's usually pretty small. In bacteria, bacteria tend to have one circular chromosome, though they might have more than one. But then they also have those little extraneous, extra bonus pieces of DNA that are called plasmids. So collectively, the chromosome and the plasmids would be the genome of the bacteria. And for eukaryotes, most of the DNA is found in the nucleus of the cell, but there's also DNA that's found in the mitochondrial, the mitochondrial DNA. Chloroplasts are also an organelle with DNA if it's a cell that has chloroplasts that does photosynthesis. And there are plasmids in some types of eukaryotic cells. So basically the, the lower um, eukaryotic cells, really the single-celled organisms like single-celled fungi and protozoa can have plasmids. All right, so the whole combination of all of this DNA is collectively known as the genome. All right, so in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell or just in the center of a prokaryotic cell, you have the main giant chunk of DNA that is called the chromosome. Okay, so the chromosome is a big, important chunk of DNA. The genome is all of the DNA. And chromosomes are neatly packaged. You have a lot of DNA in your cells. Actually, if you were to pull the DNA out of a single cell and lay it out in a straight line, un uncoil it, it would be six feet long of a human cell. So that's a ton of material to shove into the cell. So in order to do that, um, 
the DNA gets twisted and wound up really tightly. So it's packaged really tightly. Think of like a ball of yarn, right? So if you were to stretch it out, it would, you know, wrap around your house several times. But when you roll it up in a ball of yarn, it's very tight and compact. So it's kind of what we do, what we collectively as organisms do with our DNA. It gets wound up tightly, often around proteins. So in eukaryotic cells, they use these special proteins called histones, which are basically like spools to wrap DNA around. Um, the chromosome is located in the nucleus of eukaryotes. There is no nucleus in prokaryotes, so it's not located there. Prokaryotes do still have proteins that they wrap their chromosome around, but they're not histones. They're different. Um, prokaryotes usually have a single chromosome and it is circular, whereas eukaryotes have uh, linear DNA, so their chromosomes are linear and they often will have multiple chromosomes. So some other vocabulary pertaining to genetics. Um, so a gene is just a segment of DNA that encodes something. Usually it encodes a protein. So most genes, and it used to be that we thought that all genes were just segments that encoded a protein. And in more recent years in genetics, we've realized that Genes can also code for special types of RNA, and they can also code for regulatory sequences. So they can code for little pieces of RNA that don't get made into protein, but instead like feedback and turn genes on and off. So any segment of the DNA that codes something functional is a gene. The genotype uh, in the genome is sort of like the genome. So uh, no, it's not. Not really. So the genome is the collection of all the genes. Um, I guess the genome is the collection of all the DNA, and the genotype is the collection of all of the genes. So there's a lot of filler in the genome. So the DNA, you know, there's like a lot of extra bases that don't code for anything. Those are part of the genome, but not part of the genotype. That makes sense. So <clears throat> um, maybe like, okay, so if you were to, you know, if you were filling out an online form and you had to type a paragraph and it said you're allowed 200 cal characters or something like that, you start typing or like you're, you're, you know, like, I don't know, YouTube and other, other social media sites do this where they give you a character limit. A space is considered a character even though there's nothing there, you didn't write anything, it's still considered a character. So you can kind of think of the genome as all of the words, it's all of the characters, right? So all of the words and the spaces, the blank spaces in between, and the genotype would just be the words, just the coding portion. All right, so the phenotype is the physical manifestation of that organism. So um, it's the collection of traits that they actually show. So we'll talk about how genes are regulated. So just because you have a gene doesn't necessarily mean it's turned on or expressed. And so um, two people might have uh, the same gene for something, but one of them has it turned on and one of them has it turned off. So they have different phenotypes, even though they have the same genotype, right? Um, so phenotype is largely influenced by environment and when you the old-fashioned term used to be nature versus nurture right that they thought some things were encoded by our genes and some things were um, learned in our environment in our experiences but as it turns out those two things really are not mutually exclusive at all they interact quite a bit the environment determines which genes actually are turned on and turned off. So you really can't separate the two. There's no such thing as nature versus nurture. It's nature working together with nurture, um, if anything. All right, so our genome, uh, all of our DNA, whether it's the chromosome in the center of the cell or plasmids, whatever, it's all made up of DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. and the building blocks of DNA are called nucleotides. This is a picture of a nucleotide here. So a nucleotide is itself made up of a couple of parts. 
So the parts of a nucleotide are a sugar, um, a phosphate group, a single one, and a nitrogenous base. And there's four different nitrogenous bases that we'll talk about. So together, these three things together make up a nucleotide. And we can link these nucleotides together in chains, in polymers, and that is our DNA. Our DNA is long, long, long polymers. Even viral DNA is a long polymer. All right, so the nucleotide is the basic unit. Um, when we talk about DNA, I just put, want to show you, I did put this on this slide, this arrow that says 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Okay, I've labeled this end up here as the 5' prime end. It's the end where the phosphate group is sticking off. You can see the P there. And then the other end of the strand is the 3' prime end. So um, basically, DNA is directional. Okay. And when we read the code of DNA in the bases, we read it in the correct direction, which is always 5 prime to 3 prime, which is just the same as how we always read English from left to right. Hebrew is, written, is read from right to left. Right? All languages have a reading direction, and including DNA. DNA is directional. The ends actually look a little bit different so you can tell them apart and know which direction to read in. So you don't have to understand the chemistry of why it's called the 5 prime end and 3 prime end, but you do need to know that terminology 5 prime to 3 prime is just talking about, it's just like saying left to right. It's the direction that we read the DNA in. All right, so those different nitrogenous bases that we talked about, that's where I'm going to put my face, um, are for DNA. A, G, C, and T. So adenine and guanine, you can see, look similar. They both have a two-ring structure. These are the purine bases. And cytosine and thymine are the pyrimidine bases. They only have one ring. Um, and they pair with an opposite type of base. So the pyrimidines pair with a specific, each pyrimidine pair, pairs with a specific purine. So the base pairing rules for DNA are that A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C. And the amoeba sisters have a great mnemonic for this. They say the apples in the tree and the car goes in the garage to remember A, T, C, G. Um, these are some pictures here showing you how the base pairing occurs. The base pairing occurs through hydrogen bonds, which are like um, electric attractions between two uh, molecules. So A and T are held together by two hydrogen bonds and G and C are held together by three hydrogen bonds. It makes the G-C pairs a little bit stronger than the A-T pairs. So when we look at DNA, most people know that DNA is double-stranded and that it's in a double helix. So that means that two strands, uh, two polymers of DNA um, come together in hydrogen bond. And they are two strands that are running anti-parallel. So think of like a highway that's got like a northbound and a southbound lane, okay? So one strand is, is going five prime to three prime and the other one is going three prime to five prime. So they're going in opposite directions, anti-parallel. And then, of course, the, the backbone or the sort of walls of the ladder, if you will, are made up of the sugar and phosphate groups. So it's called the sugar phosphate backbone. This is the sugar phosphate backbone. And then the rungs of the ladder or the steps, if you will, are made up of those base pairs. So the ATs and the CGs. And so the beauty of this double-stranded hydrogen bond connected to strands of DNA, and I should really have them anti-parallel here, I'll do it like this, um, is that they are, it makes the DNA more stable to have it in two strands rather than just one strand. And you want DNA in a cell to be stable because it carries the genetic information throughout the cell's life and needs to be doubled and passed on, so you want it to be very stable. But at the same time, in order to replicate the DNA or express the genes, you have to be able to open it up and read it. And so hydrogen bonds are like the perfect solution because they are strong enough to, 
keep to secure the DNA, but they're weak enough to easily open it. I kind of think of hydrogen bonds as like a zipper, right? So when you have a coat and you zip it up, you can't easily break it. It's very stably closed. But if you want to open it, it's super easy to unzip it. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of energy. So it holds it you know, clo t closed tightly, but it also doesn't take a lot of energy to open if you do it the right way. So um, that's the DNA for you. All right, um, so how does DNA, let's start talking about DNA replication. So DNA replication is the process by which DNA copies itself when a cell is dividing in order to give the daughter cell a copy of the DNA. So this animation here is showing you how a bacterial chromosome or a plasmid would double itself, would replicate itself. Um, and it really starts at like a node that opens up, we call that the origin. And, and then the new strand is represented by the dotted line. Okay, so notice that it peels, sort of peels apart and each piece of the original DNA, which are in the solid lines, get a new second complementary strand, okay? You call the, the, base, the strands that match each other are complementary. And so, um, you know, for a long time when we were learning about the structure of DNA, we weren't sure how it was copied. It could have been that it was copied and you had the original two strands and two new strands bound together, but that's not how it turns out. And so this process, the way that it's done, is called semi-conservative replication, which basically just means that when you, the, a cell copies its DNA, each of the copies contains one original strand and one newly made strand. So it's semi-conserved, it's half conserved. Half of the daughter product is the original. So DNA replication is a complex process that is governed or run by several different parts of the cell, different enzymes. So this is my um, analogy like a movie or a play okay so where the different enzymes represent the cast of characters or play in in this play so the important ones that we're going to talk about are these six here um and i'll talk about their functions coming up but this is a nice little cheat sheet slide for you a table from the book that really just summarizes the whole thing so um essentially what happens the dna unzips and the the polymerase comes in and builds new new copy of the DNA. So the polymerases, these are the ones that build polymers of DNA, they are really good spell checkers. Um, they rarely make typos. Something like one in a billion bases, they'll make a typo. They actually, they might make a typo like one in a million, but they also can proofread and fix a lot of those. So they only end up actually causing a mutation every billion bases or so, um, which is which is pretty good, but it does mean that every time cells replicate, they do sustain a couple of mutations. So the more times a cell replicates, the more mutations it, it will undergo, which is why things like cancer, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of diseases that your, your risk increases um, a lot just based on age, because the older you are, the more your cells have replicated and the more mutations they've acquired over the years, just by chance. Um, so we'll talk about mutations more, but just know that mutations, a lot of times people think mutations are something that's caused by a, a mutagen, and there are things that cause mutations, but mutations also just arise in nature as a product of error because nothing's perfect not even dna replicates or dna polymerase and i'm going to put my face over here all right so we can look at this process so this is a busy slide but it's literally the whole process of dna replication in one picture so um here's some double stranded double helix dna and it's coiled up it's wound up and so the first step in order to unzip the DNA is we have to unwind it and uncoil it. So the first key player is topoisomerase, and he's pictured in yellow here. And topoisomerase's job is basically just to spin the DNA and uncoil it, uh, or really unspin it, I guess. 
then we have to separate those two strands to break those hydrogen bonds and that is the job of helicase and helicase has some little scissors on it but you really it should it would be better if it had a zipper like a zipper on it because you're not really breaking thing you're not cutting bonds you're just separating these strands so that's what helicase does and the third thing that needs to happen so once those strands are separated they really just kind of want to come back together they're attracted to each other sort of magnetically so in order to keep them open you have to keep them keep them separated and so the proteins that do that are these little purple balls here and these are called single stranded binding proteins and they basically just keep keep that um, DNA open so this place right here where the DNA is separated okay is known as the replication fork so it's like a fork in the road okay so now we can actually start making copies of the DNA and the enzyme that does that is DNA polymerase but DNA polymerase has a problem it can't bind to single stranded DNA it can only bind to double stranded DNA and so we have to create a basically like a landing spot for it so before D DNA polymerase can land we need an enzyme called RNA primase to come in and RNA primase just makes a little bit of RNA so that there's an area that's double stranded just a small landing strip basically for the DNA polymerase so the DNA polymerase can then bind there and get started and move along so there's two strands right and on this right strand we see there's one DNA polymerase and there's this long continuous red strand that's the new strand of DNA that's being made and then on the left side here we've got a couple of polymerases and if we look there's a couple of these little RNA primer regions okay so the two different strands are called the leading strand and the lagging strand so the other thing about DNA polymerase not only does it need a double a double stranded landing strip it also can only read in one direction it can only read 5 prime to 3 prime um, and so <clears throat> or it can only I should say it can only build a new strand 5 prime to 3 prime so it reads in the opposite direction um, and so on this strand over here on the right side where the original strand is going three prime to five prime in this upwards direction. So the DNA polymerase can build continuously five prime to three prime. So it can keep building up and up and up as long as this thing keeps getting unzipped, right? But the other strand, DNA polymerase has to build in the other direction. So every time it opens up a little bit more, another DNA polymerase will land and can make, so it can make DNA on the lagging strand in little segments as the DNA gets opened wider and wider another polymerase can come in and make another small segment so we call it the lagging strand so the lagging strand is made in segments we call those segments Okazaki fragments and the leading strand is made in a single continuous segment so that would be the end of things except for the fact that these little segments that are made on the lagging strand um, they need to be joined together ultimately so another enzyme will come in called ligase and ligase fuses those two segments together and then also um, we can't have new DNA that has little bits of RNA embedded in it. We have to replace that RNA with DNA, and that's the job of DNA polymerase 1. So DNA polymerase 3 is the main workhorse. DNA polymerase 1 kind of comes in after and does the spell checking and replaces the RNA with the DNA, and it's sort of like the final editor, um, if you will. So that is the whole process of replicating DNA. So this is um, just a great channel, the Amoeba Sisters, and I do wanna show you this short video um, about DNA replication, because I think seeing it moving and animated is better than trying to imagine it with a static picture. Let's see if I can get this video to play. <clears throat> It's Aspen Dental's Everyday Smiles event, where new patients get a full exam and set of x-rays with no obligation. Okay, here we go.
DNA. We talk about it so much. It is the ultimate director for cells and it codes for your traits. It's a major component of what makes you, you. When you have a really important molecule like DNA that is ultimately responsible for controlling the cell, it would make sense that when you make another cell, like in mitosis, you would also have to get more DNA into that cell. And that introduces our topic of DNA replication, which means making more DNA. First, let's talk about where and when. First, where. It occurs in the nucleus. Or if eukaryotes. the cell has a nucleus. Remember, not all cells have a nucleus. This video clip is actually going to focus on the types of cells that do have a nucleus. They're known as eukaryote cells. Prokaryotes, which are cells that do not have a nucleus, they do things a little differently. They also do DNA replication, but that is not going to be our focus for this clip. Next, when. When does this happen? Well, this typically happens during a stage known as interphase. Interphase is when a cell is growing, it's carrying out cell processes, and it's replicating its DNA. You know what it's not doing at the exact same time? Dividing. You don't want a cell to be replicating DNA and dividing at the same time. That's a little bit too much multitasking. So DNA replication does not happen during cell division, otherwise known as mitosis. In fact, cells replicate their DNA before division processes like mitosis and meiosis. Because once you make the new cell, you better have DNA to put in there. I think DNA replication would actually make a great video game. It's actually quite exciting. I'm going to introduce the key players in DNA replication so that you can get some background information. Now, the majority of these key players that I'm going to introduce are enzymes. In biology, when you see something end in ASE, you might want to check as it's very possible that it may be an enzyme. Enzymes have the ability to speed up reactions and build up or break down the items that they act on. So here we go with our key players. First, helicase. This is the unzipping enzyme. If you recall that DNA has two strands, you can think of helicase as unzipping the two strands of DNA. Helicase doesn't have a hard time doing that. DNA polymerase, the builder. This enzyme replicates DNA molecules to actually build a new strand of DNA, primase, the initializer. With as great as DNA polymerase is, poor DNA polymerase can't figure out where to get started without something called a primer. Primase makes the primer so that DNA polymerase can figure out where to go to start to work. You know what's kind of interesting about the primer that it makes? It's actually a piece of RNA. Ligase, the gluer. It helps glue DNA fragments together. More about why you would need that a little later. Now don't feel overwhelmed. We'll go over this sequence in order. Please keep in mind that like all of our videos, we tend to give the big picture, but there is always more detail to every biological process we cover. That's really true for DNA replication. DNA replication starts at a certain part called the origin. Usually this part is identified by certain DNA sequences. There can be multiple origins within the DNA. At the origin, helicase, the unzipping enzyme, comes in and unwinds, unzips, the DNA. SSB proteins, that stands for single-stranded binding proteins, bind to the DNA strands and they keep them separated. Primase comes in and makes RNA primers on both strands. Now remember, that's really important because otherwise when DNA polymerase comes in, it, it wouldn't know where to start. Now DNA polymerase can get to work. Remember, it's the important enzyme that adds DNA bases. Now you have two strands, right? They're not identical. Remember, they complement each other. They also are anti-parallel, so that means they don't really go in the same direction. With DNA, we don't say a strand goes north or south. The directions for the DNA strands are a little different. We say that DNA either goes 5' prime to 3' prime or 3' prime to 5'. Prime. This can seem very confusing. What in the world does that mean? Well, the sugar of DNA is part of the backbone of DNA. It has carbons. 
The carbons on the sugar are numbered right after the oxygen in a clockwise direction. One prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. The five prime carbon is actually outside of the ring structure. Now you do the same thing for the other side, but keep in mind the strand is flipped just because DNA strands are anti-parallel to each other. So let's count these. Again, clockwise from the oxygen, one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime, and the five prime is out of the ring. This strand on the left runs five prime to three prime, and the strand on the right here runs three prime to five prime. Well, it turns out that DNA polymerase can only work in the five prime to three prime direction. So the strand that runs 5' prime to 3' prime is fine. It's called the leading strand. But the other strand will make it a little tricky. DNA polymerase can only go in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So RNA primase, it has to set a lot of extra primers down to do that, as shown here. It takes longer, too. This strand is called the lagging strand, which is pretty fitting. On the lagging strand, you tend to get these little fragments of synthesized DNA. They're called Okazaki fragments. Amazing name. The primers have to get replaced with DNA bases since the primers were made of RNA. Ligase, remember that's the gluing enzyme as I like to nickname it, has to take care of the gaps in the Okazaki fragments. Now at the end, you have two identical double helix DNA molecules from your one original double helix DNA molecule. We call this semi-conservative replication because the two copies each contain one old original strand and one newly made one. Oh, one last thing. Surely you've had to proofread your work before to catch errors. Well, you definitely don't want DNA polymerase to make an error. If it makes the wrong DNA base, then you could have an incorrectly coded gene, which could ultimately end up in an incorrect protein, or no protein. DNA polymerase is just awesome. It has proofreading ability, which means it rarely makes mistakes. And that's a good thing. Well, that's it for the Amoeba Sisters, and we remind you to stay curious. Alrighty. So... I, th I think I've adopted their explanation over the years. I saw a lot of similarities, mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully it was helpful to kind of visualize that a little bit. <clears throat> um, okay, so that's replication. That's how we copy DNA from when we're when the cell is replicating and making daughter cells. Okay, um, but when the cell is not doing that, they are constantly making proteins. They're constantly referencing the genes in the DNA and deciding which ones they want to make into proteins. And so this process of going from the DNA to proteins is called gene expression. And the central dogma of gene expression is that DNA gets converted into RNA in a process known as transcription, and RNA gets converted into protein through a process of translation. This slide is sort of a key slide in understanding gene expression. So gene expression, basically another way of saying that is gene expression occurs in two steps. First, um, in, in a nucleated cell anyway, here's the nucleus, the DNA is transcribed into RNA the RNA leaves the nucleus and gets read by the ribosomes, and that process is called translation. So those are the two steps of gene expression. They're constantly confused because they sound alike. They both start with trans, transcription, and translation. Um, the way that I remember it is sort of, I think about the definition, layperson definition. So to transcribe something is to copy it. Before we had printers, and computers um, and typewriters, all right, people, if they wanted to make a copy of an essay or a book or whatever, they literally had to hire a scribe to transcribe it. If any Game of Thrones fans in here, all right, that's what, now I can't remember his name, but one of the characters was basically his job was to transcribe these old books um, and by hand, okay? So transcribing, you are just copying something 
like identically. You're not changing the words, you're not changing the language, you're just making a copy. And that's essentially what's happening when you go from DNA to RNA. DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids, so they're the same language, um, and you're just making a copy. Translation, though, in lay English, tr to translate is to go from one language to another, right? And RNA is the language of nucleic acids. It's, it's in the biomolecule category of nucleic acids, but proteins are a different type of biomolecule. So it's a different molecular language, if you will. So going from DNA to RNA is transcribing, and RNA to protein is translating. So that's sort of the simplified version. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that, which we won't get into. But when we have DNA, essentially, we do transcription and we make mRNAs right here. We'll talk about these other RNAs as well. And then that mRNA gets translated into a protein product. All right. But it turns out there are other sometimes these um, RNAs that get that get transcribed can actually go feedback and inhibit transcription. They can inhibit translation. So these RNAs are not just copies all the, they're not just always these, you know, go between copies. They can have other more complex regulatory functions, um, which we won't get into in this class because it's a little too deep into genetics, but it's a really cool feature of genetics that I didn't want to leave out and just at least plant the seed for, that there's these other small regulatory RNAs called microRNAs or antisense RNAs that also have therapeutic value. Um, and in fact, if, you know, I'm always relating things to the current pandemic and the vaccine company Moderna, who came up with one of the first uh, approved vaccines for use, it's an mRNA vaccine, and they are a company that started in 1990s or 80s um, working with RNA therapeutics. So while using mRNA in a vaccine for the first time, it's not really a new technology in the sense that um, it's been researched and even used a little bit therapeutically, not as in a vaccine, but um, as like genetic therapy for something like 30 years prior to the advent of this vaccine. So it's not as novel as it seems. Okay, <clears throat> so let's first talk about this part one of, trans of, of gene expression, which is called transcription, going from DNA to RNA. This is my text slide explaining the parts, but I'm going to flip to this slide and walk you through it in the picture. So there's three steps to transcription. There's also the same three steps to translation, which again just makes them easy to confuse. So the three steps are initiation, elongation, and termination. So at initiation, this is when the, the workhorse enzyme binds to the DNA, and the Workhorse enzyme here is RNA polymerase, not to be confused with DNA polymerase, which copies DNA to DNA. RNA polymerase um, copies DNA to RNA. It makes a polymer of RNA. That's what the name means. Okay, so it binds to a special region uh, or special sequence that it finds in the DNA called a promoter. So all genes have a promoter, which is basically a docking site for RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase will dock there, and then it will get started. So that's called elongation, and elongation is the process by which it reads the DNA and makes an RNA copy. So it separates the DNA strand as it goes. There's actually other there's a, the RNA polymerase complexes with a whole bunch of other proteins or enzymes that help with this process, but we're just simplifying it. Um, and RNA nucleotides come in and we build uh, a strand of RNA. So the two strands of DNA are known as the template strand and the coding strand. Well, I have other pictures, so I'm not going to label this one. The top one here is the coding strand. That's the one that we're trying to actually copy that has the gene code, all right? But the RNA polymerase doesn't actually, it can't copy 
a strand. It can't make a copy. What it can do is it can make a complementary strand. So it uses the opposite strand, which we call the template strand. And when it uses that one, it can generate a complementary strand that is virtually identical to the coding strand. The difference is that the DNA uses T, thymidine, but RNA, remember, uses the base U, uracil. So wherever there would be a T in the DNA, it's replaced with a U in the RNA. Okay, so it keeps going and going and going until it ultimately re reaches a sequence at the end of the gene called the terminator sequence, which basically tells the polymerase, you're done, you can stop now, and the polymerase leaves, and that RNA transcript is released, and you now have an RNA version of that DNA gene. So that is the, and a quick animation, because again, I just think it's so much clearer when you can see it animated. Oh, boo, I'll have to post, that link is broken. Um, transcription animation. Let's see what we can find here. Let's do this one. Egg proteins are contained in our DNA. DNA contains genes. A gene is a continuous string of nucleotides containing a region that codes for an RNA molecule. This region begins with a promoter and ends in a terminator. Genes also contain regulatory sequences that can be found near the promoter or at a more distant location. Motor region of the gene functions as a recognition site for RNA polymerase to bind. This is where the majority of gene expression is controlled by either permitting or blocking access to this site by the RNA polymerase. Binding causes the DNA double helix to unwind and open. Then during elongation, the RNA polymerase slides along the template DNA strand. As the complementary bases pair up, the RNA polymerase links nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing RNA molecule. Once the RNA polymerase reaches the terminator portion of the gene, the messenger RNA transcript is complete, and the RNA polymerase, the DNA strand, and the messenger RNA transcript dissociate from each other. The strand of messenger RNA that is made during transcription includes regions called exons that code for a protein, and non-coding sections called introns. In order for the messenger RNA to be used in translation, the non-coding introns need to be removed, and modifications such as a 5' prime cap and a 3' prime poly A tail are added. This process is called intron splicing and is performed by a complex made up of proteins and RNA called a spliceosome. This complex removes the intron segments and joins the adjacent exons to produce a mature messenger RNA strand that can leave the nucleus through a nuclear pore and enter the cytoplasm to begin translation. How is the information in the mature messenger? I'm, I'm going to memorize this and come back to it. Can I come back to it? We'll see. Because <clears throat> um, that's going to be a good animation, I think, coming up of translation. So one of the things in that video, it was referring specifically to transcription in a eukaryotic cell. And I know that for two reasons. One, because it talked about the mRNA leaving the nucleus. And two, because it mentioned these introns and exons. So introns and exons are specific to um, eukaryotes only. And I will talk about those coming up, but not right here. So first, I just want to ca categorize some of the main differences between DNA and RNA, since that's what we do in transcription, go from one to the other. So one of the differences, obviously, is in the name. One is DNA, the other is RNA, and that D and R come from the name of the sugar. So DNA uses deoxyribose as the sugar, and RNA uses ribose. And the difference between them is actually this one oxygen right here. So notice that on ribose, there's an OH, and on DNA, there's an H. That's why it's called deoxyribose, because it's missing an oxygen. Um, as far as the bases go, both use C, A, and G. But DNA uses T, or thymidine, and RNA uses U, 
or uracil. And then um, lastly, DNA is usually double-stranded, whereas RNA is usually single-stranded. It's not 100% always the case, but 99.9% .9 of the time. So when it comes to making RNAs, the type that we make during transcription specifically is mRNA or messenger RNA. And messenger RNAs encode proteins. They go to the ribosome and they get translated, which is the next step of gene expression. But there's lots of other types of RNA that can be made. Um, uh, there's rRNA, which is ribosomal RNA. So the ribosomes themselves are made up of a mixture of protein and RNA, and the ribosomal RNA is part of that. Um, tRNAs play a role in translation coming up. We'll see them. Um, so these are the three types I'm going to hold you accountable for knowing because they're all three key players in gene expression part two, translation. Um, regulatory RNAs were the ones I was talking about before when I talked about how there are little RNAs that can get made that can then feed back and inhibit transcription or inhibit translation. So they regulate gene expression, basically turn things on and off. And these guys are pretty important. Um, primer RNAs, we saw those in DNA replication. The primase makes those little pieces of primer RNA. So that's a spe you know, special class of RNAs in and of itself. And then there are also some RNAs that can actually act as enzymes. So 99.999% of all enzymes are protein, but there are a handful that are RNA. And in fact, there are some evolutionary biologists that think RNA was really the first molecule of life because it can encode things, but also can catalyze reactions. So it's a little bit like DNA and a little bit like protein sometimes. But these things are a little bit deeper into genetics and we won't really go into detail with them, but I do like to mention that they exist because they're cool. All right, so now for part two of gene expression, translation, going from RNA to protein. And the cast of players here, there's really just three. Um, the ribosome, which is the major machine of this portion of gene expression, the mRNA, which carries the message, and the tRNAs, which bring amino acids. And amino acids, of course, are the building blocks of proteins, and it's linking the amino acids together that results in building a protein. Um, the rRNA is present here too. It's part of the of the of the ribosome. So this big guy here is the ribosome, where I think the greenish areas, greenish blue, represent rRNA, and then these tan sections represent protein co components. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> how does the ribosome actually read this RNA? Well, it reads it in basically like three-letter words called codons. So these little three-letter codes, AUG, for example, is a codon. It happens to be the start codon. It initiates the start of translation. So each codon codes for a specific amino acid, and the tRNAs have an anticodon, which is complementary to the codon, and that's how it brings the correct amino acid to that spot. So here's a, um, a codon here, AAA. This is the codon. The codon is part of the mRNA. And the tRNA, and, and that codon codes for the amino acid lysine. So the tRNA that carries the lysine has an anticodon that's complementary to that. It's UUU. And so the genetic code is known. We've cracked the genetic code. Um, molecular biologists have. And there's 64 possible different codons, 64 combinations of those three, or the, of those four different letters. And each one codes for a specific amino acid, with the exception of the stop codons. So you'll also notice that there's one AUG here is the start codon. It also codes for an amino acid methionine. So basically all proteins start with methionine. Um, they don't all keep the methionine because during processing in the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus, they get trimmed a little bit. The proteins get trimmed, so 
not all proteins start with methionine, but the process of making all proteins starts with methionine. Um, and then there are three stop codons. The stop codons are kind of the equivalent to the terminator sequence that we saw with transcription. The stop codon tells the ribosome to stop. The protein sequence is over. Um, you'll notice that for there's 64 different codons but there's only 20 different amino acids. So there's a lot of redundancy in the genetic code. For example, proline here, I'll just pick proline. All right, there's four different amino acids that code for proline, CCU, CCC, CCA, CCG. So basically any codon that starts with CC will give you proline. And we call this flexibility of that, so it's the third um, position in the codon is kind of flexible. We call it the wobble position, or we call it that we say the genetic code contains wobble, which basically is some built in safety measures so that, like, you know, a third of mutations, or if there's, if there's a mutation in that third base of the codon, it doesn't change the amino acid. And so it allows the genome to sustain mutations every now and then if they're lucky then they don't actually affect the protein product so it allows for a little bit of error a little room for error if you will um, so so some have four different codons um, some have leucine has six different codons methionine only has one codon though and serine some you know, serine has six so some of them have two or four or six different codons and that redundancy and the wobble of that third position are basically safety features. They're security features that make it harder to cause bad mutations and makes the um, genes a little bit more robust to and able to handle mutations. So this process of translation happens in the same three steps as transcription, we've got initiation, elongation, and termination. So in both cases, initiation involves the major machine docking to its nucleic acid template. So in transcription, it was the RNA polymerase docking to the promoter sequence. But in translation, it's the ribosome and it's docking to the first start codon, which is pretty much always a UG. Okay, so once it docks to the start codon, now it can start reading the mRNA and translating it into an amino acid sequence. Um, and it keeps doing that until it reaches a stop codon. And at the stop codon, that's the termination. It stops reading from there. See if I can get my other video back. Yeah, let's watch from here. RNA strand translated into a protein. The nitrogenous bases are grouped into three letter codes called codons. The genetic code includes 64 codons. Most codons code for specific amino acids. There are four special codons, one that Sorry. codes for start and three that code for stop. Translation begins with the message. Oh, it got cut off. Okay. So we'll go back to my original link then. Here we go. I call it saving money by customizing car insurance with Liberty Mutual. There's also an Amoeba Sisters one. In prokaryotic cells, translation is initiated by formation of an initiation complex consisting of the 30S ribosomal subunit, formal methionyl tRNA, and messenger RNA. The 50S ribosomal subunit then joins the complex. Proteins called initiation factors are also involved, but are not shown. The 70S ribosome has two sites to which transfer RNA-carrying amino acids can bind. I'm just going to pause here. He said the 70S ribosome. So my question for you is, is this a video of prokaryotic translation or eukaryotic translation? And you should be able to identify this is prokaryotic translation because we're talking about the 70S ribosome. Eukaryotes have an 80S ribosome, but it virtually works the same in, in both. Organisms. One is called the peptidyl or P site, and the other is called the acceptor or A site. 
There is also a third site called the exit, or e-site, where transfer RNAs are released. The initiating transfer RNA carrying formal methionine binds to the P-site. A transfer RNA that recognizes the next codon and carries the second amino acid then moves in to the A-site. The formal methionine carried by the transfer RNA in the P-site is then joined to the amino acid carried by the transfer RNA that just entered the A-site by a peptide bond. The ribosome now advances a distance of one codon and the transfer RNA that carried the formal methionine is released at the E-site. A transfer RNA carrying the next amino acid now moves into the A-site where the anticodon on the transfer RNA matches the codon on the messenger RNA. The ribosome shifts down by a distance of one codon. As the shift occurs, the two amino acids on the transfer RNA in the P-site are transferred to the new amino acid and the second transfer RNA is released from the E-site. The ribosome continues to move along the messenger RNA and new amino acids are added to the growing polypeptide chain. Elongation of the polypeptide is terminated when a stop codon moves into the A site. A stop codon does not specify an amino acid and does not have a corresponding transfer RNA. The ribosome dissociates into the 30S and 50S subunits and the messenger RNA and protein are released. So that's the animated version of it all. <clears throat> all right, I have a couple of slides now that I just couldn't decide between that are good summary slides of the whole thing. Um, I'm not going to go through, I'm not going to show you another video. There's lots of videos that I like about on this topic, but you might go to YouTube and watch this one. Um, teacher's Pet Protein Synthesis is a, a good summary video. And I think just watching these videos, just seeing the process over and over and over again until you have really internalized it and understand it. So it's overwhelming at first. There's a lot of parts. Um, but the more you, you see it in action, I think the more you're able to internalize it. And this slide is meant to be almost, you know, like a reference sheet, like a cheat sheet to <clears throat> remember all the different parts. So you've got double-stranded DNA up here. And there's two strands of DNA. One is the coding strand. That's where the actual gene is that you're trying to transcribe and translate. And then there's the template strand. And that's the strand the RNA polymerase is going to read in order to generate the mRNA, which is complementary to the template strand and nearly identical to the coding strand. Okay. Um, the mRNA is then read by the ribosome and I guess the tRNAs, in conjunction with the tRNAs, these codons on the mRNA code for specific amino acids that you can, you can figure out by looking them up on the gene, genetic, genetic code chart. So we could, we, could, um, def, we could look these up right now. So AUG, if we go back to that chart, we would see AUG codes for methionine, and CUG codes for leucine, and ACU, codes for threonine and so does ACG. Okay, so that's where these amino acids come from. The amino acids are brought to the ribosome by these tRNAs which contain anticodons which are complementary to those codons. All right, um, so some of the ways that transcription and translation is a little bit different in prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. All right, for one thing, prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. So in eukaryotes, transcription occurs in the nucleus, then the mRNA leaves the nucleus and goes to the cytoplasm for translation. But since prokaryotes, like bacteria, don't have a nucleus, they can do both simultaneously. So they can have RNA polymerase, making an mRNA transcript, and the ribosome can go ahead and jump onto that mRNA transcript as it's being made and already start transcribing it or translating it. So that's one of the reasons why bacteria can, can reproduce so much faster too, is they, their cells can just basically make things faster because they don't have that separation. Everything's kind of happening all at once. They're really good multitaskers.
um, inside bacterial cells. So another thing that can happen is they can form these polysomes. Um, so in eukaryotes, mRNA, you make one mRNA per gene. But in prokaryotes, you can actually make uh, an mRNA that encodes several genes or several proteins. And you can have several ribosomes attach and all working at the same time. So bacteria can really pump out proteins very quickly. So this is just a table summarizing the differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic transcription and translation. Um, they both have a similar start codon. So for bacteria, they always use AUG as the start codon. In fact, uh, eukaryotes usually use it as a start codon. Um, bacterial mRNA, like I said, can actually encode several genes. You can make one mRNA that has several genes or several protein codes on it, whereas eukaryotes make one mRNA for one gene. Um, <clears throat> another thing is that you saw in one of the videos was that eukaryotes, when they make an mRNA, it's actually a bunch of segments of introns and extrons. And the introns get cut out. And so the basically the mRNA has to mature. It has to be spliced and edited it before it's in its final, final draft to go to the ribosome. Bacteria don't have introns and extrons. What they make is ready to go. It doesn't need any further editing. And this is an important issue when we talk about gen genetic engineering, because if we're trying to make human proteins in bacteria, we have to edit the, the DNA sequence and get rid of those introns because bacteria don't know what to do with them. They can't splice out introns. So you do have to modify the genetic information if you want to make human proteins or eukaryotic proteins in a bacteria. You have to splice out all those introns before. Um, another thing about bacteria that we just said was that they can do transcription and translation uh, simultaneously because they do them both in the cytoplasm, whereas eukaryotes do them one at a time, transcription in the nucleus, translation in the cytoplasm. So that is, that is the central dogma. We talked about gene expression, how genes are converted into proteins through transcription and translation. Okay. Now, all of your genes are not being made all of the time. That would be a huge waste of energy. So there are control mechanisms within the cell to control which genes are on and which genes are off, which ones are being transcribed and translated and which ones are not. We talked, we referenced these small RNAs that can be used as regulatory elements, but a really cool feature that bacteria have built in in order to regulate gene expression is something called an operon. So an operon is basically a, a unit um, of the DNA where there's multiple genes for the same process all lined up in a row, and they're all controlled, turned on and off together. So the classic one is the LAC operon, LAC for lactose. So this is a segment of DNA that codes for multiple enzymes that are necessary for digesting lactose. Okay, and this is um, something that bacteria have, and they can control all of, they can turn all these genes on and off at once because they're all controlled on the same, the same unit. Okay, so the components of an operon are, there's a regulator, which is a, a sequence here that um, a repressor can bind to. So an inhibitor can bind there or unbind from there. All right, then there's the promoter, which is the spot where the polymerase, the RNA polymerase always binds and then can take off and do transcription. If there's something blocking, if there's something bound here to this regulatory segment, the promoter is blocked, it can't bind. Um, the, <clears throat> Oh, no, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. That's the, I'm talking about the operator. The regulator encodes that inhibitor. It's called the repressor. The repressor binds to the operator segment and blocks the promoter. So it would block the RNA polymerase. So if the repressor is there, you don't get transcription. If the repressor is not there, you do get transcription. So this is actually really a better, 
uh, drawing here. So the regulator is this segment, is a gene up upstream of this operon that codes for this reg repressor, which is like an inhibitor. The repressor binds to this section called the operator. And then when RNA polymerase wants to come bind to the promoter and transcribe, it can't because it's blocked. The repressor protein is blocking it. And this happens, this is the scenario when there's no lactose around. Because if there's no lactose in the environment and no lactose in this bacteria's diet, they don't need to be making enzymes for digestion of lactose. But if lactose is around, lactose acts as an inducer. So it induces or turns on the gene expression. And it does that by binding to that repressor and removing it from that segment of the DNA. So now the RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and read uninhibited and, and make an mRNA transcript that can then be translated into proteins that can then digest lactose. And when all of the, dig the lactose is digested, um, there's no more lactose to bind to these repressors and they will uh, block the gene again. So it's this negative feedback loop um, that controls and, and it is an energy saver because it ensures that the bacteria only makes these enzymes when there's lactose around and when they're needed and they're turned off automatically when they are not needed. So operons are a really cool way that bacteria can regulate gene expression. Another way that bacteria but also eukaryotes can regulate gene expression and one that's really important for pathogenicity is something called phase variation. And essentially it's the ability of bacteria to take, or cells really, to take DNA segments and flip them. Um, and remember DNA is directional, right? So if you flip it in the reverse direction now, it's unreadable. Um, it's, a, you know, backwards. So my name is Sarah, but if you flip it to Harris, then that's not my name anymore. That's something else. And so um, when we do that, we can flip the promoter around and basically it turns a gene off. So we've, one thing we've talked about um, bacteria being able to turn on and off is their fimbri. And fimbri are regulated, um, in some bacteria anyway, through this phase variation ability. So they're able to basically flip a piece of DNA around and then the promoter is facing the wrong direction and no longer facing and actually directing transcription of the fimbri gene and the fimbri turn off. So depending on environmental conditions, it triggers that flipping um, of, the, of the DNA and the turning on or off of the gene for fimbri. And this is important for for pathogenicity, right? Because fimbri -E allow bacteria to stick and helps them colonize. So if we had some kind of drug that could block this production of fimbri, -E, block this phase variation step, then that would be an effect, could potentially effective antibiotic. So DNA recombination occurs. I think my battery is going to die. Oh, well, I'll wait for the warning. Um, all right. So DNA recombination, it literally means to recombine DNA. So you're taking DNA from different organisms and stitching them together, or you're taking DNA from different bacteria and you're mixing them. So even when a um, bacteria undergoes conjugation and trades plasmids with another bacteria, that's a form of recombination. It's a mixing and matching of genetic material. So bacteria are unique, well, from multicellular organisms. Um, single cellular organisms, I should say, not just bacteria, but pr um, protists or protozoa can do this as well, and so can single cell uh, fungi. So unicellular organisms have this ability to do horizontal gene transfer. Humans do not, all right? We can transfer genes vertically. We can pass genes on to our offspring, but we can't pass genes on to our friends and neighbors. Um, but single-celled organisms can because they can do it through a couple of different ways. One, they can do it through conjugation. So bacteria have a structure called a pilus, which they can use to attach to another cell and transfer DNA through that tubular appendage of the pilus. Conjugation is kind of like bacterial sex in that 
it's transferring genetic information. Um, transformation is another process we'll talk about, which I like to think of it as cells fishing for DNA in their environment. Um, transduction is when cells obtain new DNA from viruses that infect them. So all of these are different ways that bacterial genomes or single-celled organisms that their genomes can be altered through recombination events, through getting new genetic information. And it's really important for us to understand these things for two reasons. One, because it's oftentimes how organisms become pathogenic by gaining new abilities through new genes that they acquire, or how they become antibiotic resistant through gaining resistance genes. Or it, if we understand these processes, we can utilize them to our own benefits and use them for our own um, designed recombination events to create new strains of bacteria that can do all kinds of cool things for us. So that first type of, we're going to talk about those three different types of horizontal gene transfer. The first one is conjugation, um, which is done by the pilus, which I like to think of a little bit as the bacterial penis. And I didn't come up with that. This is not a drawing I drew. This is actually from a textbook that I used in a microbiology class that I took in high school. And it was called Microbiology Made Ridiculously Simple. And it's a microbiology textbook. Like It's like a a spark notes microbiology textbook for med students to try to have all these mnemonics to remember things right so i always thought that this picture was funny and that's always forever after that how i pictured the pillus so it is a tubular structure it's used to deliver dna so these are two cells that are fused through a pillus and here is a plasmid that has replicated itself and it, the copied plasmid is now being transferred to the other cell so the pilus is actually a, an optional structure. Not all bacteria have them. And in fact, the gene for the pilus is encoded on a plasmid. And so you can grow a pilus, essential bacteria can grow a pilus if it acquires one of those plasmids. So we call it the F plasmid or the F factor, F for fertility. So the F factor is just a plasmid that carries the gene for a pilus. And an F plus cell that has a pilus can mate with an F minus cell and actually transfer that fertility factor so that they both become pilus havers. Another really common type of plasmid are ones that are called R plasmids or R factors or resistance plasmids. And these carry genes for antibiotic resistance or for some kind of virulence factor like toxins um, that, are, that cause disease. So these plasmids, while not part of the mandatory part of the chromosome of a bacteria, are really kind of the DNA that we worry the most about because they oftentimes enhance pathogenicity through antibiotic resistance or toxin production, and they have the ability to trade them um, if they have a pillus and to make more cells have pillas and be able to trade DNA. Transformation is just the ability of a cell to pick up DNA from its surroundings. So this is actually where this animation is really cool. This is actually a mi mi microscopic video um, of bacteria fishing for DNA. So here's a couple of bacteria just in regular <clears throat> black and white lighting. Okay, and this is the aqueous environment that they're floating around in. And there were other bacteria living here, and some of them died. And when they died, they spilled their guts out everywhere, right? So there's bacterial DNA just floating around here in this mix. They're not just in a, you know, water environment. There's tons of stuff mixed in here, including DNA. And some bacteria have the ability to actually take in DNA that they find in the environment. They're like little you know, dumpster diver, like opportunists, okay? And I can see that because I have been a dumpster diver. I still am actually, but it's not in the many opportunities here in the Adirondacks. But when I lived in Philadelphia and, and when my friends who've lived in New York, people throw stuff out on their, on their sidewalk all the time. So, you know, like when they're redoing their redecorating or moving, they throw out perfectly good stuff on the sidewalk. And as you walk by, you're like, 
don't oh I think I oh well, I think I'll take that picture frame or that whatever and um, and you acquire stuff for free so it's kind of what bacteria do when they're doing transformations like they're they're shopping they're dumpster diving a little bit in this dumpster of DNA waste that's around them and so not all bacteria can do this sorry I'm moving because my my battery's dying not all bacteria have this ability um, and if you look at this animation, they really do look like they're sending out a fishing line and picking up this DNA. And um, so you can think of it as not all bacteria have fishing gear, okay? The ones who do can do this. Um, so this drawing here on the right is, is sort of a depiction of what's happening. So a cell that can do this, we call them competent. Competent cells are cells that can pick up or take in DNA from their environments. Not everyone can, um, or not every, every type of bacteria can. And so in a, a competent cell, they can in, you know, bump into some DNA in their environment, internalize it into the cell, and even incorporate it into their cellular genome, or circularize it into a plasmid in the cytoplasm and it becomes that extra an extra bonus piece of DNA so that process is called transformation in nature some bacteria are competent are naturally competent and do this and a lot of those are pathogens so it's how one of the ways that a non that that a not so special bacteria can acquire antibiotic resistance there are certain pathogens that have become antibiotic are very very easily become antibiotic resistant because they can just pick up resistance genes that are freely lying around especially in environments like hospitals um, but we can also treat cells in the lab in order to make them more competent or make them sort of more porous so even cells that are not naturally competent in a in a lab setting, we can make them more competent and sort of force DNA into them through some cool lab techniques. So it's one way that you can get new DNA inside of a cell, both in nature and in the lab, is transformation. And then lastly, there's transduction. So transduction is introducing DNA through a virus. And in this case, that we're talking about bacteria, so we're talking about bacteriophages. So bacteriophages, when they inject their, their DNA, they, they instruct the cell to make more copies of their DNA and package it into new virus particles. But sometimes a little piece of the cellular DNA might get broken off as the cell's dying and, um, and get incorporated into a virus, a phage particle. And then when that phage goes and infects a new cell, instead of injecting phage DNA, it's injecting some bacterial DNA from another bacteria. And now this cell has acquired new bacteria. It doesn't make more viruses because there's no viral DNA. That virus shell, the capsid, was just served as a vector to transmit this DNA from one bacteria to another. And it's totally accidental in that case. But in a lab setting, we can do this on purpose. We can build phages and package our own DNA into them and use them to infect cells and permanently alter their genetic material um, or temporarily alter it, depending. Okay, so uh, another way that genes can be horizontally transferred is through this mechanism, a natural mechanism called transposons. So transposons are genes that exist in bacteria but also in eukaryotes. And they are likely elements that came from viruses, ancient viruses that infected, you know, our ancient ancestral cells. And these, you know, viruses have the ability to um, go lysogenic or latent in a cell, depending if you're a prokaryote or eukaryote, and then they can pop their genome out. And so these genes still retain, they're no longer viruses, but they're fully integrated portions of our genome, but they still retain this, this ability to pop out, pop in to new places. And in bacteria, sometimes they'll pop out of the 
chromosome and into a plasmid and plasmids are very transmissible so it's just another way that DNA can get transferred from bacteria to bacteria okay so when we are making um, DNA when we're copying it during replication sometimes mistakes are made and we call those mistakes mutation so any change from the normal sequence is called a mutation so we call the normal sequence in biology it's called the wild type i don't actually know why it's called that and it always used to confuse me because wild and normal don't like mesh in my head they're not the same they're different words but wild type means normal in biology and then if it's not wild type any difference from the wild type is called a mutant um, and mutations often happen spontaneously just from errors that arise during replication from the dna polymerase making a typo um, but there's also induced mutations and these are mutations that arise from environmental factors that damage dna um, things like radiation or various chemicals so um, bacteria are in some ways much more sensitive to mutations than eukaryotes are because they replicate so quickly um, they're you know uh, in in you know 10 years a bacteria has can go through I don't know thousands millions of generations whereas humans can go through one um, our cells replicate a lot but not nearly as fast or as many times as bacteria do so essentially bacteria can evolve faster Mac bacteria sustain mutations and then those mu mutations proliferate and continue um, in populations their populations just grow faster and turn over faster than those of eukaryotes and certainly animals and so they the mutations that arise in those populations are even if they're rare they're often observable because bacteria just they make so many um, okay so the different types of mutations we're going to focus on primarily different types of point mutations and a point mutation is a change in one single dna base one point and the different types of point mutations are addition deletion and substitution so an addition Mutation would be adding an extra base somewhere. Deletion would be removing, accidentally removing or losing a base. And substitution is changing a base, so changing a T to a G or something. Um, a missense mutation, so the consequences of those point mutations can vary. So the mutation itself is happening in the DNA. But the long term result of that is a potential change in the protein. Okay. And so when we talk about missense, nonsense frame shift, we're kind of referring to the downstream effects of that point, of that addition, deletion, or substitution. So an addition, deletion, or substitution could result in a missense mutation. And a missense mutation is one that changes the amino acid sequence. I guess a fourth one that we should put on here and the first one is um, move this up this word up the list so the first let's say the first type of mutation is a silent mutation and a silent mutation occurs in that wobble position where ccu becomes ccc but it doesn't change the amino acid we call that a silent mutation because there's no downstream effect of it um, a missense mutation is one that changes an amino acid so it does actually change, uh, you know, proline to a serine, okay? Now, some amino acids are really similar and some are really different. So if you change uh, the amino acid to another amino acid that's very similar, it, a lot of times it won't affect the shape of the protein or its function. And that's technically another type of silent mutation if there's no um, ultimate effect on the protein function. But um, a lot of times it changes to an amino acid that's very different looking. And since the amino acid sequence determines how the protein folds, and how the protein folds determines the protein function, a missense mutation can really F up a protein, even if it's one 
amino acid out of a thousand amino acids, if it's an important amino acid and how it folds, then it can screw up the whole thing. Um, a nonsense mutation is one that ends up changing a normal codon into a stop codon. A, I should say a normal codon into a stop codon. And so it ultimately results in a shortened or truncated is the, is the correct term for that. So a shortened protein. So maybe it was supposed to be 500 amino acids long, but there was a, a nonsense mutation halfway through and it ended up being 250 amino acids long. So that's not the whole protein. Then it's definitely messed up there. A frame shift mutation is uh, the result of additions or deletions. So an addition or a deletion basically throws off the whole codon reading frame. If you're reading three letters at a time and you take out one of those letters and then you shift everything, so you're still reading three letters at a time, you've shifted all of the codons after that. So this slide here um, kind of illustrates that, so those different types of mutations. So here's the normal gene here, all right. Um, in example B, we've changed one of these amino, or one of these bases in the DNA. We changed it to a G. It got mutated from a G to a T, and that resulted in an amino acid change from a sparagine or, or no, aspartic acid to glutamic acid. Okay, which they may or may not have the same function, and so that may or may not affect the proteins, the proteins function or not. Um, in example C here, we went CTG to CTA, but that's a, a wobble base, and so it still encodes the same amino acid. So this would be an example of a silent mutation. It's a substitution mutation, but it's also a silent mutation because it results in no change of the amino acid sequence. Now insertions and deletion, or this would be a deletion where we remove a G, and here's an insertion where we're adding an extra G, those result in frame shifts. So notice how when we pull out that G, we then have to shift the rest of these letters down, and so all of the codons after that point are now different. They are shifted and different. And so um, all of the amino acids after that point end up changing. And in this one, it also it caused a frame shift, but also a nonsense mutation because there's an early stop codon here. And then in example E, this would be an example of an insertion where an extra base is added. And it also results in a frame shift mutation. All of these codons, are all the letters get shifted over, and every codon after that point is changed, and all of the amino acids after that point are also changed. So luckily for us, cells do have the ability to, even when they do have a mutation, there is some ability to repair those mutations. So your cells are acquiring mutations all of the time. A classic example is when you go out in the sun and you get a sunburn um, and you get exposed to a little bit of too much of UV light. UV damages DNA. It specifically causes thymines that are next to each other in the DNA to stick together and they end up forming like a kink in the DNA. And it makes it difficult for DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase to read, but particularly DNA polymerase, it can't read it correctly and then it makes then it makes errors when the cell divides. Um, and so these thymidine dimers are not reversible in humans. But we do have actually, we have some, some very general ways of fixing mutations. So that's why you don't get cancer like after one sunburn. Um, but if you acquire enough of these thymine dimers and don't fix them, then it can result in skin cancer. Okay, bacteria have a, a, another type of mechanism. They can actually repair these thymine dimers through an enzyme called DNA photolyase, which is actually activated by sunlight, a different wavelength of light than 
the UV that causes the thiamine dimers, but they do have an ability to fix those to some extent. If they acquire a lot of them, then they just overwhelm their DNA photolysis, but they do have the ability to fix those. So cells are equipped with some machinery to fix mutations, but if they acquire too many mutations, then they just, you know, their machinery can't handle fixing it. So I wish we had these, and I don't know if there's any research for some kind of, you know, sun therapy to, you know, use photolyse somehow to help prevent skin cancer, but it's an interesting idea. So the kind of repair that eukaryotes have, prokaryotes have this too, is a more general repair called excision repair. So the photolysis repair specifically targets thymine dimers that are caused by UV. Excision repair is just any time this, this complex, this sort of proofing complex, is skimming through the DNA, <laughs> excuse me, and finds like a mismatch or a thymine dimer or, you know, something that doesn't look right, it can just cut out the whole chunk that, of error DNA and then the polymerase comes in and repairs it, basically. So it is a, a method and it catches, it's more likely to catch sort of larger scale, like um, breaks in the DNA, whereas like a small substitution, a point mutation might not get noticed. Okay, so mutations, we tend to think of mutations as a bad thing. Um, and they can be. Mutations can cause the cell to die. That's definitely true. But cells also, as if you think about X-Men and mutations, if you're an X-Men fan, you may think of mutations as a good thing, as a way to acquire superpowers. And in fact, that is something bacteria use it for too. Sometimes the new the mutations give them new adaptive skills that help them survive in their environment. And sometimes a mutation has no effect at all. It's not harmful and it's not helpful, but it can become harmful or helpful if the environment changes. So for example, with antibiotic resistance, that's what happens a lot of times. You have a culture of bacteria and you plate them out. So you got all these colonies. And if we were to like examine these, we found that, oh, one or two of them randomly had a mutation that made them resistant to drugs but they you know are a minority and if you kept growing cells in this tube those two cells might die off and not you know their their family lines may come to an end and then that resistance ability goes away but if you take some of those cells from this culture or if you take this culture and now you add some antibiotics to it okay and you wait a little while um, and then you plate the bacteria you'll basically find that all of them are antibiotic resistant because basically what happened was the antibiotics killed all of the non-resistant microbes and the ones that were resistant kept dividing and dividing and basically the whole population gets taken over by those fit, those more fit bacteria, the ones that actually have antibiotic resistance. So in an environment without antibiotics, these antibiotic resistant microbes are in the minority and oftentimes die out. But by exposing them to antibiotics, we are selecting for those mutants that have that resistance. And that's what we do when we overuse antibiotics. When we are using antibiotics in the medical field, we are ultimately trying to kill bacteria, but what we unintentionally sometimes do is select for and propagate resistant bacteria. So antibiotics have become a bit of a double-edged sword for us. And really that's just because bacteria are very talented at mutating and propagating. So because of that, uh, having a good understanding of bacteria and how they manipulate DNA has actually been really good for us in the field of genetic engineering. So uh, I said genetic engineering made possible by creative thinking and the discovery of some handy enzymes for cutting and pasting DNA. So all of the genetic engineering like technologies that we use in the lab that allow us to develop things like COVID-19 vaccines and insulin for diabetics are all because of some basic biology researcher who found these 
enzymes inside bacteria and we're like huh what do they do and then realizing oh we could use that so the first one are these enzymes called restriction endonucleases and they're part of bacteria's basically like really primitive immune system so the only thing that infects bacteria are vi are phages bacteriophages bacterial viruses and um, phages all the bacterial phages do is inject their DNA into the bacteria. So bacteria have all these enzymes that basically chop up foreign DNA. Um, that's their, their defense against bacteriophages. And um, so they have a collection of enzymes called restriction endonucleases that cut up DNA. And they cut at specific sequences. Um, and they tend to be palindromes. So a palindrome is something that when you read it forward and backward, it says the same thing. So this one is G-A-A-T-T-G-C, G-A-A-T-T-C. Um, and ECOR1 is just the name of this, of, of a restriction endonuclease. And so it cuts in this pattern here where it leaves these little hanging edges and um, so it's an enzyme that was discovered in bacteria the bacteria use to fend off or to you know protect themselves from invading bacteriophages but it's an enzyme that we can purify and use in the lab to cut and paste dna or to do the cutting part the pasting part is done by the enzyme ligase which we saw earlier in the lecture Ligase is part of, it's an enzyme involved in DNA replication. It glues those Okasaki fat fragments together, right? So when we are trying to subclone and cut and paste DNA in a tube, we also use ligase to um, fuse ends of fragments of DNA together. So we can cut with a restriction enzyme and paste with a ligase. Another enzyme that's been really handy is the reverse transcriptase enzyme, and that's one that's found in retroviruses, and it allows us to do the central dogma backwards. So normally we go, you know, a polymerase DNA or RNA polymerase takes DNA and makes it into RNA, but reverse transcriptase can take RNA and make it into DNA. And this is important if we are trying to express human proteins in prokaryotic cells like human insulin because remember eukaryotic cells have introns and extrons in their RNAs so their genes contain introns and extrons so you can't cut eukaryotic DNA and paste it into a prokaryote because they won't know what to do with those introns and extrons but if you take a mature piece of, of eukaryotic RNA that has the introns cut out already and you can reverse make that into DNA through reverse transcriptase, then you can make a gene that prokaryotes can read, and you can trick prokaryotes into making a mature eukaryotic protein or a mature eukaryotic mRNA for that matter. So reverse transcriptase was um, a huge tool for being able to um, do genetic engineering in which we made human molecules in bacteria, which we do for a lot of biologic drugs, including insulin. So this is just an image kind of showing you how restriction endonucleases work. They cut at those specific palindromic sequences, um, and they leave these little overhangs that then if you cut another piece of DNA with the same restriction enzyme, they have matching overhangs and you can paste them together. So you could cut out a gene from one organism, paste it into a plasmid, and then get that plasmid into a bacteria. Um, some other tools that we use in genetics, um, we can use restriction enzymes to do essentially DNA fingerprinting. So you one of the early genetic tests like in criminology was you could take the dna um for so like for example like a paternity test actually no it wouldn't work for a paternity test you really need it to be identical dna so like dna from a crime scene and then dna from a suspect and you you cut them with a restriction enzyme and then the dna is in all these different it's cut up into different fragments of different sizes and you can run those fragments out on a gel 
and that's called gel electrophoresis. And it'll give you a different pattern. So th these are not DNA fingerprints, but essentially you'll get a pattern of multiple bands. And if two of those rows match, all right, the suspect who matches the crime scene fingerprint, um, it's a DNA match. So it's a sort of crude way, kind of like fingerprinting, um, to, to get a genetic match. Um, this is actually showing you using restriction enzymes more likely to do some cloning. So maybe they cut and they were looking for a specific size piece and then they can actually cut that piece of gel out. And when I say gel, I mean like this is like made out of agar, like it's basically like a slab of jello and they put it in some buffer and run an electric current through it and the current pulls the DNA from one end to the other and the shorter pieces move faster through the gel and the longer pieces move slower and so they end up separating out and so restriction enzymes and gel electrophoresis are really important techniques or tools in genetic molecular biology i should say another amazing tool is pcr so PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it's a way of making lots of copies of a piece of DNA. Um, and in, it's because the, the number, they, they double each time you do a round. It's basically DNA replication in a tube. So it's um, a piece of DNA plus some nucleotides and a DNA polymerase and some buffers and it just you just um, put it in a machine that cycles at different temperatures that allows for initiation, elongation, termination, initiation over and over again. So each time you go through a round, through a cycle, you are doubling the number of DNA. And so in the initial cycles, that's a small number, but then it increases exponentially. And after like 30 or 40 cycles, you end up with millions or billions of copies of that piece of DNA, and you can do a lot with that. That could, so PCRs can be used in criminology. Um, they can be used in cloning in lab research to make to make the piece of DNA that you want to paste into something, um, <clears throat> and they can be used in diagnostics. A lot of diagnostic tests are PCR tests where they are looking to see if you have a fragment of a pathogen, if you have some DNA of that pathogen inside you, they can um, get a sample that has a very small, undetectable amount of that DNA and do a PCR to amplify it. And if that DNA is actually there, you get tons and tons and tons of it in the PCR. And if that DNA is not there in the individual, then you get a negative result. Um, this is just another slide sort of showing you the process of PCR. So in PCR, you have uh, a piece of DNA, and then maybe you have a target site that you're trying to amplify. And so you have primers for that segment in there. You go through three steps. So the first step is heat denaturing. So when you heat up the machine, or you heat up the tube, it melts the strands apart. So you don't have a helicase in there. You just use heat to, to um, separate the strands of DNA. Then you cool it down a little bit so that your primers, your little primer pieces stick, but the two strands don't come back together. And then you heat it to change it to another temperature, which is the optimal temperature for your polymerase. And the polymerase binds docks to that primer and then can make a copy. And then you do it again. You melt it to separate the strands. You cool it to have the primer anneal or stick and then you go to the optimal temperature for the, the um, polymerase and you do this over and over and over again to just, you're basically just doing DNA replication in a tube multiple times on the same piece of DNA. So when this process was first invented, the, the guy who came up with it, he literally stood, it takes a couple of hours to do this. Um, you have to like hold the tube in uh, t at different temperatures for like, you know, like a minute each. Each of these steps takes like a minute, but you have to... And so the first guy who did it, he, he literally stood there with water baths of different temperatures and just went back and forth, back and forth for like two or three hours. And it worked and it was awesome. 
um, but it's not really a sustainable technique. And so they may they make machines now that you just put the tubes in and set the machine settings, and they automatically change temperatures, which was a huge game changer in molecular biology, because you just mix some stuff in a tube, walk away, come back a couple of hours later, and you've got millions of copies of a piece of DNA. I mean, it's pretty cool. So um, when we are trying to design uh, bacteria to produce certain proteins for us, or maybe design um, bacteria for a vaccine, all right, and we're intentionally manipulating the DNA, we do that using these different organisms. So recombinant DNA technology is when humans use our ability to recombine DNA. And we use it for a lot of different things. We produce a lot of um, hormones. So any type of hormone therapy where people are taking synthetic hormones, those hormones are not created in a chemistry lab. They're usually created in a microbiology lab um, where a bacteria is programmed to make that protein and then it goes to the chemist for purification. Um, various enzymes, vaccines, a lot of these are made through recombinant technologies where we cut and paste genes of interest. Um, and same thing with genetic cloning. I'm going to skip over cloning. Um, so the, the newest development in this field of cloning, of basically recombining humans, artificially recombining DNA, um, is this, this machinery called CRISPR. So CRISPR was also kind of like restriction enzymes in the sense that it was discovered in bacteria as part of a primitive bacterial immune system. It's a way that bacteria can target viral DNA and chop it up. But it turns out it's much more sophisticated than um, restriction enzymes. So restriction enzymes recognize specific sequences that they are like pre-programmed to recognize. Whereas the CRISPR um, complex, can, you can basically program it. So it is programmed by a little piece of guide RNA. And so you give it a guide RNA, and that is where it will go. It will find DNA with that sequence, and it will cut. It can also be programmed to replace seek. So it can either cut and ligate together. It can cut something out. It can cut and put something in, all right, and it's incredibly programmable. So you can, with restriction enzymes, they just, they, they will cut wherever they see that specific sequence. And if that sequence is in the middle of a gene, they'll cut it anyway. You can't control where restriction enzymes cut as well as you can target precisely where the CRISPR-Cas9 complex cuts. And you can target it because it uses a piece of RNA. So what the way that bacterial cells used it is, um, you know, a virus comes in, and the cell recognizes that DNA or that DNA or RNA of the virus of the phage, and it basically sticks it into its CRISPR-Cas9 system, and then CRISPR-Cas9 goes around the cell and looks for DNA with that sequence and cuts it up. Um, but it can be used for genetic engineering and has been used and has really revolutionized the field. Um, it's how we are able to very quickly make something like a COVID-19 vaccine because, um, and there's so many different ones that are that are in development still, because we, with the, the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 and the use of it, the popularization of it, it has sped up the speed of molecular biology by so much. So um, when my mentor was in grad school, um, in order to like making a single recombinant line of bacteria was like a five year project that was like your whole PhD project. Now it's like a couple of days, like undergraduate students can do it in lab. You can do it like this. Um, with this CRISPR-Cas9 system. And so last year in 2020, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry actually went to the two researchers who were co-discoverers of CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and your video of the week is actually in a lot more detail about CRISPR-Cas9 and how it works. So I couldn't 
talk about DNA and genetic engineering without talking about this really new awesome technology that's revolutionized the field and really just sped up the rate of discovery and and science. So that is the end of this chapter. It's been long enough.